I have some big news for you. While the majority of influencers are telling people with both type one and type two diabetes to lower their carb intake to increase insulin sensitivity, we're taking a radically different approach. We had the honor of working with a research team from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, otherwise known as PCRM, including Dr. Hanna Kaliova and Dr. Neil Barnard. This amazing research team published the first randomized control trial showing that a low fat plant-based whole food diet increases insulin sensitivity by 127% and reduces insulin use by 28% in people living with type one diabetes. This is the first study of its kind and I'm excited to share the results with you. Now, as many of you may know, I've been living with type one diabetes for 22 years now. In that time, I've been able to increase my insulin sensitivity by more than 800% and I've helped more than 10,000 people become extremely insulin sensitive. I'm the co-founder of Mastering Diabetes, the New York Times best-selling co-author of the book, Mastering Diabetes, and I have a PhD in nutritional biochemistry from UC Berkeley. To date, no research team has performed a direct comparison of the effect of a low-fat plant-based whole food diet versus a conventional portion control diet in people living with type one diabetes. Now you would think that with all the attention on nutrition in today's world, a randomized control trial investigating the effects of a low-fat plant-based whole food diet on people with type 1 diabetes would already exist. In this video, I'll share the results of the randomized control trial that we recently published and show you exactly why and exactly how this approach increases insulin sensitivity, not just by a small amount, but by a staggering 127%. And be sure to stay until the end because I'll walk you through some incredible results that you're gonna wanna see. Now, before we go too far, let me give you a quick crash course on type one diabetes in case you fell asleep in biology class. Now type one diabetes is commonly referred to as juvenile onset diabetes because it traditionally affects young children and adolescents. It's an autoimmune condition that destroys the insulin producing beta cells in your pancreas and that in turn reduces your endogenous insulin or your self-made production while increasing the need for exogenous insulin, which is insulin from the outside world. In the United States alone, about 1.3 million adults are living with type one diabetes. And the CDC reports that type one has increased by almost 30% over the last decade. Now, if type one diabetes was purely a genetic condition, then the proportion of the population that has type one would remain consistent over time. But since the rate of type one diabetes diagnosis is actually increasing by 30%, that suggests that this is more than a genetic disease. It's likely a combination of genetics and environment together. Now type one diabetes can be very dangerous because recent research shows that 65% of all people living with type one diabetes for more than 20 years will die of cardiovascular disease and that more than 50% of people living with type one diabetes for more than 30 years will die of kidney failure. Those are truly scary statistics. Now dietary recommendations for people with type one diabetes typically emphasize carbohydrate counting or frank carbohydrate restriction. The majority of endocrinologists suggest limiting carbohydrate intake between 30 to 100 grams per day and increasing fat and protein intake to quote unquote, stabilize blood glucose. Let's see what social media influencers have to say. We want to be moderate to very little fruit if you're already insulin resistant. We want to cut out grains both processed and complex because there's very little difference in blood sugar impact. And we want to start eating more fats. I always get the higher fat percentage. This is 85% beef to 15% fat. And it's a little cheaper than the lean, uh, what is this, 95.7. You're probably gonna overcook that. And like I said, the fat in here is healthy. It's actually good for you because it's pasture raised, never eaten grain. Eggs are the closest thing to a superfood or a multivitamin that you can have for breakfast. And then also you're gonna have almost no movement of your blood sugar whatsoever, which is, I want you to verify that. This largely follows the dietary recommendations given to people with type two diabetes and explains why many social media influencers gain a lot of traction when they tell people with diabetes to avoid carbohydrates and eat a lot more meat and fat rich foods. Now I'll be the first person to give credit where credit is due. Eating a low carb diet will certainly lower your blood glucose values. There's no question about that. In addition, it will also lower your A1C, increase your time and range, and make your glucose significantly easier to manage. Now, when living with type one diabetes, having a somewhat flatlined blood glucose profile every day can be a gift from the heavens. But even though your glucose is more controllable, it comes at a very high cost. 
including an increased risk of heart disease and kidney disease. Scientific evidence shows that a high fat diet is the single most effective method at inducing insulin resistance in both your liver and your muscle. These studies clearly demonstrate that increasing your fat intake has an immediate negative impact on the ability of insulin to communicate with tissues, which can then develop into a chronic state of insulin resistance and diabetes if your fat intake remains high. So what happens when you eat a low carb, high fat diet is that you suppress your blood glucose values while increasing the degree of insulin resistance specifically in your liver and in your muscle tissue. Now it may seem like a win in the short term, but it's like playing with fire in the long term because the more insulin resistant you become, the higher your risk for diabetes complications, including, but not limited to, coronary artery disease, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, chronic inflammation, chronic kidney disease, and peripheral neuropathy. Certifiably not good. And yes, this happens in people with type one diabetes, which creates a massive problem that increases the risk for premature death. Now we've been saying this for years, insulin resistance is a massive problem in people with type one diabetes, and it's time that the type one community wakes up to the fact that low carb diets increase insulin resistance in people with type one diabetes, even though they flatten your 24 hour glucose profile. Now we're honored to have done a research study in combination with Dr. Hanna Kaliova and Dr. Neil Barnard from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. We enrolled 58 men and women with type one diabetes with a stable insulin dosing regimen and randomly assigned them into either a low fat plant-based whole food group or a portion controlled group. Those in the low fat plant-based whole food group were asked to eat 75% of energy from carbohydrates, 15% from protein, and 10% from fat from vegetables, grains, legumes, and fruits with zero limitations on calories and zero limitations on carbohydrate intake. They were told to avoid animal products and added fat rich foods to favor foods with a low glycemic index when possible. Those in the portion control group were provided with an individualized diet plan that controlled portion size and carbohydrate intake. And participants who had a BMI greater than 25 were told to restrict their total energy intake by about 500 to 1000 calories per day. They were instructed to keep carbohydrate intake stable on a daily basis with about 60 to 70% of energy from carbohydrate, 15 to 20 from protein, less than 7% from saturated fat and less than 200 milligrams a day of cholesterol. Here's what happened after 12 weeks of this intervention. Body weight decreased significantly by about 5.2 kilograms or about 11 and a half pounds in the vegan group. No significant weight change occurred in the portion controlled group. Insulin total daily dose decreased significantly by 12.1 units per day in the vegan group, despite the fact that they were eating 111 grams more carbohydrate energy per day. There was a non-significant difference or of about 1.4 units per day in the portion control group, even though they decreased their carbohydrate intake by 38 grams per day on average. This is one of the most important findings in this paper. The vegan group ate an average of 111 grams more carbohydrate energy per day. But despite that, they dropped their use of insulin by 12.1 units per day. That's more carbohydrate for less insulin, which is exactly what happens to many of our other clients. Now, on average, I eat about 10 to 12 grams of fat per day. And that's made a huge difference on my insulin sensitivity. The guys are not kidding when they say it works. And my insulin per day, which is the fun one because my carbs have stated, have been at the, are now at the high range of what I used to eat. And I have gone from using 45 to 55 units of insulin per day. And now I only use between 30 and 35 units per day. And it's going down. Like I just had to adjust my basal down and I'm going to have to adjust my uh, lunch bolus down already because I'm going low in the afternoon again. So it's going to be lower than that. My insulin sensitivity, like as yesterday was around 27, 28, uh, carbohydrates to one. So I'm taking, I've halved my, I was 28 basal at night um, of Tujeo and my I'm now sort of hovering around 14 at night, but that's coming down, it's, but I'm slowly doing that. But what's interesting is that the conventional wisdom of reducing carbohydrate intake didn't lower insulin requirements by much, a meager 1.4 units per day. Now granted, the portion control group only lower the carbohydrate intake by about 38 grams per day. But logic tells you that even with a reduction this large, they should have a significant effect in their insulin requirements. So if you put it all together to calculate insulin sensitivity, which is the holy grail of glucose metabolism, the vegan group was able to eat 6.6 .6 grams 
more carbohydrate per unit of insulin. But the portion control group lost insulin sensitivity by 1.6 grams of carbohydrate per unit of insulin. What this means is simple. The vegan group became more efficient at processing carbohydrate energy because after 12 weeks, they could eat more carbohydrate for less insulin. In fact, they became 127% more efficient at processing carbohydrate energy, given that their carbohydrate to insulin ratio increased from about five to about 12 grams per unit. Now the A1C also decreased by about 0.8% in the vegan group and by about 0.6% in the portion control group, which suggests that both diets had about the same effect on lowering blood glucose values in the long term. Now that's great news for both approaches. Total cholesterol dropped by 32.3 milligrams per deciliter in the vegan group and by about 11 units in the portion control group, which is strongly in favor of the plant-based diet. Now LDL cholesterol decreased by 18.6 milligrams per deciliter in the vegan group and did not change significantly in the portion control group. Now this is important because data from more than 1 million participants has demonstrated a strong positive relationship between LDL cholesterol and coronary artery disease risk. Researchers are well aware that saturated fat is the most powerful nutrient in the diet that increases LDL cholesterol, as was established by Dr. Hegstead back in the 1960s with the Hegstead equation. Now this particular equation showed that cholesterol and saturated fat from sources such as eggs and meat in the diet raises harmful cholesterol levels. Given this composition of the portion controlled diet, it's likely that the inclusion of foods higher in saturated fat and cholesterol kept their LDL cholesterol from dropping. The vegan group, on the other hand, ate significantly less saturated fat and zero cholesterol, resulting in a statistically significant drop of 18.6 milligrams per deciliter in their LDL cholesterol. Now, as far as their HDL cholesterol is considered, the good cholesterol, it decreased by 12.4 milligrams per deciliter in the vegan group, and it didn't change in the portion control group. One criticism of the plant-based diet is that it causes a reduction in HDL cholesterol, but the reason this happens is because the LDL cholesterol concentration also drops. In other words, the less bad cholesterol there is, the less of a need there is for good cholesterol. Now here's why the study is actually kind of a big deal. Like we talked about before, the traditional approach to managing glucose in people with type one diabetes often calls for either a low carb diet or for just flat out less food overall, specifically for those people who are overweight. As if managing blood glucose itself wasn't hard enough, eating a low carb diet can be very challenging. Now, I was there myself 20 years ago and I gave it up after one year because I could not make it work and I felt terrible. Now this study demonstrates something very important which is that eating a low fat plant-based whole food diet enables people with type one diabetes to lower their insulin requirements, increase insulin sensitivity, get better blood glucose control, lose weight, and lower their total and LDL cholesterol. All of that with zero portion control. It almost sounds too good to be true. Now to the best of our knowledge, there's no other dietary approach that can accomplish all of this together especially increasing insulin sensitivity dramatically by 127% while significantly improving all the other cardiometabolic risk factors. Now earlier, I referred to insulin sensitivity as the quote unquote holy grail because it's the single most important metric of glucose metabolism. Why? The reason is because type one diabetes is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular death. During 30 years of follow-up in the diabetes control and complications trial, Higher insulin doses were associated with a higher risk for cardiovascular disease in people with type one diabetes. Now, I know what you might be thinking. You're gonna say the reason why people in the vegan group use less insulin and gain insulin sensitivity is because they lost weight. Now weight loss itself decreases insulin requirements, which is a true statement. So it makes sense that losing about 11.5 pounds would result in increased insulin sensitivity. But here's the deal. We took this into account because we knew that it was gonna happen and we corrected insulin sensitivity for it. And we found that when we corrected insulin sensitivity for weight loss, we found that the vegan diet still resulted in 24% reduction in insulin dose. What that means is that weight loss itself is not an adequate explanation for the reduction in insulin use. If you calculate the insulin sensitivity per kilogram of body weight at the end of the study, you'll find that insulin sensitivity in the vegan group is more than double the portion control group. So what does that tell you? 
When you correct for weight loss, the vegan group is still twice as insulin sensitive as the portion controlled group. This is very important because about half of all adults with type 1 diabetes are overweight. Data from type 1 diabetes registry from the years 2016 to 2018 shows that 29% of people with type 1 are overweight and 20% are obese for a total of 49% of all people with type 1. That's why weight loss in people with type 1 diabetes is more important than it may seem on the surface. And this again highlights why weight loss of 7.8% in the vegan group is clinically significant. Now we're very excited to be paving the way for improved health in people with type 1 and be able to demonstrate that a low-fat plant-based whole food diet has profound results on lowering insulin use by 28% and increasing insulin sensitivity by 127%, while lowering body weight, lowering A1C, lowering total cholesterol, and lowering LDL cholesterol simultaneously. This is the first study of its kind, and we're proud to say that this lifestyle dramatically increases cardiometabolic health for people living with type 1. If you'd like to read the paper, please check the information in the box below the video. And if you or anyone you know is interested in getting similar results for yourself, come join thousands of others who are going through this process right now, especially if you're living with type 1 diabetes or if you know someone who's living with type 1 diabetes, this is your chance to take full control of your diabetes health starting today. All you have to do is visit masteringdiabetes.org start to speak with a member of our team who can place you in the right coaching group and help you change your life for good. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel We'll get you more information as it comes out. We'll see you in the next video.